turn to love or action All this aggravation ain't satisfaction in me A little more bite and a little less spark A little less bite and a little more spark Close your mouth and open up your heart Baby, satisfy me Satisfy me, baby Satisfy me, baby Satisfy me, baby The fun thing about researching the movie company is, is that there were several songs that were cut from the movies and never came out on the records. So a fair bunch of the rarities we found over the years are actually from the movie company balls. Um, very interesting is Viva Las Vegas where they actually recorded 12 songs but only released six. And uh, two of those that they uh, didn't put out on record were the duets with Anne Margaret, Elvis's leading lady and according to people who know Elvis also his love interest at the time but they never they weren't released at the time and at least one of them is absolutely fantastic. I think Elvis's manager thought it would be bad for Elvis to have a strong leading lady uh, singing on his records. It was like well he's tried to position Elvis here nobody was on the level of him so he couldn't have a duet. I don't know whether that's the story, but that seems to be the most logical story. Tonight she'll hold me in her arms. I'd rather be holding hydrogen bombs. Will someone tell this uh, Romeo? I'm not his Juliet. The lady loves me, but she doesn't know it yet. I don't think we ever got to see Elvis as an actor in a uh, in a proper setting there were some good beginnings jailhouse rock and king creole show talent there were two more serious films in the early 60s that uh, didn't go as well flaming star and wild in the country they, they keep pointing fingers at these movies and i think that's incredibly unfair this is what you know today would be uh, MTV, VH1. These were promo films. These were film clips. And the best of them are absolutely sensational. If you see Elvis in his shirt in 1957 in Loving You, or Elvis in the dance routine of Jailhouse Rock, they stand up to anything on MTV today. And that's what it was. It was a way of communicating to people who were not fortunate enough to go to an Elvis concert. It was a little bit smarter from the record company uh, record company's point of view and Elvis's point of view is that they got money from these showings of films around the world. They made money on them. Today, the artists and the record company pay money to have them show. And it is the same thing. It is uh, it's presenting the artist to the world. Elvis didn't ever uh, tour outside the U.S. This is how we knew what Elvis looked like. We didn't see Elvis on TV in 56 like Americans did here in Europe. They saw the Dorsey shows and uh, Ed Sullivan shows weren't on TV in most of Europe. We only knew Elvis from these films. So they were very important. Um, I don't know, you know, whether acting is, is really appropriate in many of them. It, uh, it was getting from one song to the other and try to fill the space with something. And people have often blamed Elvis for for these movies uh, and he did get tired of them himself but at the time when he made one of the movie contracts uh, he signed on for about seven years with a million dollar guarantee a year and had to do three movies it took about three or four weeks and uh, in them would be six or seven very pretty girls how hard can that be I think the the highlight for me in watching Elvis perform is the movie uh, that's the way it is because you see him still being able to do what he could do in the past with rock and roll uh, although it's a little toned down there's actually a number of great uh, rocking songs in there but at the same time you see what is so unique about Elvis and what the critics never understood in that movie he is in total control by now so everything that goes on there is his choice. And you see the way he puts the music together is without any kind of musical prejudice. I don't think too many artists can claim the same thing. But you'd see Elvis draw on his 
country, gospel, rock and roll, blues, roots, put all these songs in, in, in whatever order he thought was the best. And I think he was probably one of the most open-minded musicians there ever was. He, he didn't feel that he had to uh, explain to the world why these songs fit together, but they do in that movie you see him being everything that he is capable of within one single movie. I think it's utterly fascinating, that little piece of film. Yes, I think he is the most important of them all simply because he initiated things. That could have made, maybe there could have been somebody else initiating the same thing, but there wasn't. Elvis did that, and that he brought more different types of music together in his fusion of what American music was than anybody I've seen, but the movie I like the most is Jailhouse Rock. Um, there's several songs in that, they're absolutely outstanding. Treat Me Nice is a pop song, Jailhouse Rock. That scene alone is a classic, the dance scene of Jailhouse Rock. And I always loved the song Baby I Don't Care, and it is, uh, along with King Creole, his best attempt of serious acting. And I think he could have made it, but didn't really get the chance. I think when we get to basically as early as 1970 when Elvis goes on the road again for the first time outside Las Vegas, I think the shortcomings become very visible. I think he had lost perspective of it all. I think he wasn't up to date on what management was by then. And, and yes, he did turn down offers. He turned down movie offers he should maybe have said yes to. Um, and... Uh, I don't think he understood the business anymore. The, the point with the Colonel was he never had another client. He had nothing to compare it to. And I don't think he had a lot of friends who would tell him. There's been so many highlights in, in doing this research world of what we found, and some of them have been extraordinary. Um, one very fond memory I have is actually not something I found. I was sitting in a conference room in Paris and Priscilla Presley and uh, Jerry Schilling and some of the people who uh, uh, worked with, uh, with Graceland at the time came into the room. I'd never met Priscilla and never met any of these people. And we sat down and Priscilla said, we have something we want to play to you and want to hear your opinion. We, 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 we think this is Elvis. And then they played My Happiness, the first recording Elvis ever made for his own money. I just remember sitting there in, in Paris in 89 and hearing an immature Elvis singing this old love songs on a scratchy old record. That to me was, in a way, the inspiration for what happened and has been happening for the next um, 15, 17 years now. Because later we found another one like that. I got a phone call from a guy in St. Louis who said, I have something you're not going to believe. Did you know there was a second acetate that Elvis made? I said, yeah, I heard the rumor. Well, listen. And then he played just a little snippet on the phone. Um, There's a guy called Sean O'Neill, and I got on the first plane to St. Louis, and we sat there, and we couldn't believe it. He'd found it in, somebody had advertised a few photos, and uh, in there was this record that, don't know how it got there. But we had other situations like that. Uh, sometimes we were sitting in the studio playing all the old tapes, and it says on the box what's on it. And suddenly you hear something going, well, you're right, where, what was that? You find out that they ran out of tape that night. So uh, they turned the tape around. It was a 16-track tape. They only recorded on the 10 tracks. They turned it around. And on the other side, there was a song that nobody knew Elvis had ever recorded. It was an old country song called 100 Years From Now. But there was no notes of it. <laughs> 